Everyone got some notes? No? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Arch. Um, okay, well, the notes come around. Uh, and before we invite Andrew to come, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Alright, man? Can I pray? I'm going to pray, man. <laughs> Father God, we are thankful uh, for this day, for another opportunity for us to gather in this way. We're thankful that we can gather tonight, Lord, in, in peace uh, and in safety. And we pray that you meet with us, prepare our hearts now to you uh, from the blessed brother Andrew for his faithful study, Lord, and um, speak freely through him now. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 I knew it was a big mistake on my part putting two tables at the back. <coughs> uh, it's like being back in school. You always have the troublemakers well away from the front. Or at least that's where they want to be. Uh, uh, I haven't forgotten, by the way, the uh, a series. Uh, the last set of notes I did was uh, I only think I covered the first page was to do with the, from the time of the Lord's betrayal uh, to Calvary. But when I looked at it, there are four passages uh, in the New Testament that are referred to concerning Judas's betrayal. Uh, <coughs> three of them are from the Psalms and one uh, is attributed to uh, Jeremiah. Uh, and we're only going to look at one of the Psalms Concerning Judas is Psalm 69, but we'll take us our reading, uh, part of Acts chapter 1. Uh, <clears throat> the first part of Acts, is, uh, Acts chapter 1, is taken up with the Lord's last teaching to the disciples during the 40 days after the resurrection. Uh, and then uh, Acts 1 records his ascension uh, into glory. And we read from Acts uh, chapter 1 and verse 10, and then we'll turn to Psalm 69. Uh, Acts 1 and verse 10, uh, we'll go back to verse 9, sorry, Acts 1 verse 9. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they, that is the disciples, beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where aboard both Peter and James, and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued uh, with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and said, the number of names together were about 120, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric uh, let another take. 
Wherefore are these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John and the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be appointed to be a witness with us of, of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. If we come back to verse uh, 16, uh, Peter uh, says in that verse, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Uh, he's referring uh, to two Psalms, uh, for example, in verse 20, uh, verse 20 is a, a, a composite, if you like, of two verses, or parts of two verses, one from Psalm 69, uh, which we'll look at in a moment, and the other from Psalm 109. Uh, but what is interesting in verse 16, notice uh, what Peter says. Uh, Psalm 69 is written by David, but Peter in verse 16 says that David spoke by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he spoke uh, by the mouth of David concerning Judas, uh, who was guide to them that took Jesus. And we'll turn to Psalm 69 because in the first place, Psalm 69 uh, deals with David's sufferings. Uh, commentators are divided as to whether Psalm 69 speaks about David's sufferings when he was on the run from Saul. Personally, I think that is more likely. Uh, others say no. Uh, it was when he was fleeing from Absalom. Both were occasions uh, of great uh, suffering, of great uh, personal uh, agony for David. Uh, and yet, uh, in David's sufferings, he, com he composes this psalm, uh, and the Holy Spirit takes hold of David's thoughts and words, uh, and what David says initially concerning himself goes way beyond David's own sufferings. Uh, David might not have known uh, who exactly uh, was going to die for his sins. Certainly, we are told in the book of Acts, he was a prophet and he spoke, for example, of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Psalm 16, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Both Peter and Paul, uh, on different occasions, argued that David could not possibly have been speaking about himself because he did die, he did see corruption. Uh, his body, his grave, uh, was a witness to the fact that David, like all of us, unless the Lord comes, uh, died and uh, his body, uh, it was dust to dust uh, as the Lord had decreed. But David, in this Psalm, uh, Psalm 69, we're not going to look at the whole Psalm, but uh, it's all on the uh, sheet that I produced, especially the uh, highlighted verses we look at. Uh, Psalm 69 can be divided into three sections. Uh, the largest section uh, concerns the sufferer, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that goes down as far as verse 21. And then from verse 22, we have the sentence, God's sentence upon Israel, for rejecting their Messiah. Uh, and that goes down uh, <clears throat> to verse 28. And the last part of the psalm deals with salvation, particularly the salvation of Israel. You notice how the psalm begins, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. I sink in deep mire. Uh, literally, in the Hebrew, it's the mire of an abyss. Uh, David wasn't necessarily speaking literally, but the picture is that uh, of a man in a quagmire. Uh, the more he strives to get out of it, the more he finds himself sinking. And David, on the run from Saul, was in desperate trouble. And he likens uh, his sufferings, he likens the persecution uh, of Saul uh, and those uh, who prepared to take Saul's money uh, to hand David over to him. 
He likens uh, his situation to a man uh, who is drowning and there seems to be no prospect. Uh, and he says in verse 3, I am weary of my crying, my throat is dried, mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. And we're not going to uh, look at the psalm in the context of David's suffering, but uh, the Holy Spirit, as I've said, takes David's experience and uh, he who knows the end from the beginning looks on to a time when a greater than David, David's greater son, would suffer far, far more than David ever did. Uh, and if we come to verse 4, you notice that, uh, that that's the first quotation in the New Testament from this psalm. Maybe I should have said earlier that Psalm 69 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, but one. And I wonder if anyone can hazard a guess as to which psalm is quoted more than Psalm 69. I will give you a clue. It's another messianic psalm. Sorry? One up. It's the one before it. The psalm that begins. How does Psalm 22 begin? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Interesting that, that Psalm 22, Psalm 69 are the two psalms most quoted in the New Testament. And they both deal with the sufferings of Christ upon Calvary. Take Calvary away, deny the redemptive work of the cross, and we might as well shut up shop, so to speak. If Christ did not die for our sins, then what does Paul say? If he didn't die and rise again, we are of all men most miserable or most to be pitied. But in verse 4, uh, the Lord Jesus quoted this in the upper room. They that hate me without a cause. Uh, the quotation actually is from John uh, 15. It's in the second column on the first side of the sheet. The Lord Jesus is in the upper room and he is speaking to his disciples and he tells them, well, we know how uh, John 14 begins, let not your heart be troubled. The Lord had told them that he was going to leave them. But he said, although I'm going to leave you, I will send another comforter, one like myself, the Holy Spirit, and he will bring all things to remembrance. And there were many things that the Lord Jesus said that the disciples did not understand. But the Lord in the upper room uh, spoke to them and said of the Holy Spirit, He will teach you, He will guide you into all truth. Uh, and then, uh, because the Lord Jesus never did anything in secret, He said that to Pilate, He said, Why askest thou me? Uh, in secret, that I said nothing. The Lord Jesus faithful in every detail, warned his disciples that their ministry was going to involve them in persecution. And at the end of John 15, he says, don't marvel, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. He said, if I had not come, they would have had a cloak for their sin. But he said, because I've come, because I've revealed the Father, They've hated me, and they've hated my father, and their sin has been exposed. Uh, he says that in John 15, verse 22. And then he goes on in verse 23. He that hateth me, hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated me, both me and my father. And notice verse 25, the Lord Jesus says that his enemies, even in their hatred of himself, unwittingly were fulfilling the scripture. The Lord Jesus was not taken aback, he was not taken by surprise by the, uh, the murderous enmity of the religious leaders. He says in John 15 verse 25, this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law and then he's quoting from psalm 69 verse 4 
they hated me without a cause. You remember, we won't turn to John's Gospel, but you remember the Lord Jesus uh, in John 10 said to these very same people as enemies, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those good works, he just healed the blind man in John chapter 9, for which of those good works do you stone me? And what was their answer? They said, for a good work, we stone thee not. But thou, being a man, makest thyself God. The issue of our Lord's deity was at the crux of their hatred. Interesting that sadly many, even in Christendom, even in Baptist circles, have denied the deity of the Lord Jesus. And if the Lord Jesus is not God, then he is grossly dishonest. He is far more dishonest, he is far more of a sinner if he's not God than, for example, the Apostle Peter. Because you remember the Apostle Peter in Acts 10 uh, is sent by God to Cornelius. And as soon as Peter gets into Cornelius' house, what does Cornelius do? He falls at his feet to worship him. And Peter, to his credit, says to Cornelius, stand up, he says, because I'm a man just like yourself. Uh, what about the angel that uh, gave the revelation to, to John the Apostle at the end of, John's, uh, uh, of the book of Revelation? John uh, falls at the feet of this mighty angel and the angel says, no, uh, I'm just a witness to the glory of the Lamb of God, just like your brethren, the prophets. The point I'm making is that Peter and the angel and others, Paul, for example, at Lystra in Acts 13, uh, protested because the people of Lystra thought he was Mercury and Barnabas was Jupiter, and they brought out sacrifices to offer. And Paul says, men of Lystra, stop doing it. He says, we men of like passions unto you. We come here to preach that you should turn from these vanities. We are not God, but we've come to proclaim the God who bears witness to himself because he sends the rain, uh, his sun shines, we are men. Uh, those people, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, the angel, they were quick to tell people, we are not God. Don't you dare worship us. You worship him. If the Lord Jesus was not God, then he accepted worship when he had no right to do so. Uh, eight days or a week after the resurrection, you remember Thomas, uh, when the Lord said, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, look at the wounds. Thrust your hand into my side. Feel the, the print of the nails. And what was Thomas's reaction? My Lord and my God. And the Lord commended Thomas because the Lord said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. What had Thomas believed? Well, what he just said, that Jesus was his Lord and his God. Here was Thomas, uh, a devout Jew, who uh, until he was called to follow Jesus, worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet he says to the carpenter from Nazareth, my Lord and my God. And, Thomas, and the Lord didn't say, Thomas, now, You've gone too far. I'm just a man like any of the prophets. He accepted the worship and he said, Thomas, you believed because you saw. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Believed what? Believed the very thing that Thomas believed, that Jesus of Nazareth was both Lord and God. That's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Let all the house of Israel know that God hath made this same Jesus, whom he crucified, Lord and Christ. Uh, and so, uh, verse 4 is the first quotation from Psalm uh, 69. The Lord Jesus said, uh, Their very hatred is a fulfillment of God's law. You know, uh, it's easy to say it, especially 
if we are not suffering as, may, as much as maybe others are, for example, Christians in Nigeria. But how often has Pastor emphasized that nothing takes God by surprise. The very worst that could happen to the Saviour, he accepted it because he knew he was fulfilling Scripture. But what an indictment of the children of Israel. They hated him without a cause. But if we go further uh, into Psalm 69, we're not going to look at the whole Psalm. You notice verse 7, 8 and 9, a quotation, are quoted in the New Testament. Uh, verse 7 is similar to verse 9. So let's look at verse 8. The Lord Jesus, uh, 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 the psalmist says of himself, I have become a stranger to my brethren and alien and to my mother's children. That was true in the sense of David because he had to flee from Bethlehem. And in fact, things got so bad for David, he was so afraid of Saul's hatred that you remember, we won't turn to 1 Samuel, he arranged for his father and mother to leave Bethlehem, to leave Israel, and to take refuge in the country of Moab. Why Moab? Well, uh, David had, if you go far back, back far enough, David had relatives in Moab, didn't he? His great-grandmother was Ruth the Moabite. Uh, and so David uh, knew what it was to have to flee from home. Uh, and when one does, in the light of verse 8, how many of his brothers were actually prepared to stand by him? We know at least one brother, Eliab, was jealous when David uh, went to fight uh, against Goliath. But uh, how, how appropriate it is of the Lord Jesus, and I've included John 7, it's not actually a quotation, uh, but in John 7, uh, the Lord Jesus was about to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's quite clear that his brothers uh, were totally unsympathetic. He said, well, if you are a great one, if you are a great miracle worker, why don't you go up early to the feast? The crowds will be there. Uh, why don't you seize the opportunity uh, to do as many miracles as you can? Verse 4, any man who wants to be known uh, does not do things in secret. What a wrong idea they had. The Lord Jesus did not come to be popular. He did not come uh, to proclaim himself. He came to glorify the Father. Uh, he said so uh, in John 17, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son. Why? That he might also glorify thee. And John 7 verse 5 says, Neither did his brethren believe in him. Interestingly, I wonder, is that why in Acts 1, the passage we read, it says that in the upper room, the 11, I almost said 12, uh, I should, but I'll say 11, the 11 disciples were there. Judas, of course, wasn't. And it singles out the women, Mary, the mother of the Lord, and his brethren. Uh, those same brothers, when John said, did not believe in him, uh, by the time of the Lord's ascension, they had come to be believers. I wonder why. Well, we know that the Lord appeared to one of those brothers uh, from 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to James, the Lord's brother. Uh, and James, uh, almost certainly the writer of the epistle, uh, an unbeliever at the time of John said, but by the grace of God and because of the resurrection, he and his brothers became a believer. But verse 9 uh, is quoted in two different passages. Let's look at verse 9. Uh, this too was fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Uh, as far as David is concerned, even as a young boy, a young lad, David was, David was zealous for the house of God. One of the cutting comments that he had to endure when he was fleeing from Saul, there were those, he says so, uh, in 1 Samuel, you find it in chapter 24, uh, and then in chapter 26. Uh, in those two chapters, uh, David spares Saul's life, and he says to Saul in chapter 24, why do you listen to those who slander me? 
Those who have said to me, David, you have no portion in the Lord's inheritance. Get out of Israel, go and serve other gods. What a cruel comment to make to someone who from a very early age loved to have fellowship in the house of God. He wrote Psalm 23, of course, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Uh, and David was zealous uh, for the house of God. Uh, we won't turn to one chronicles, but uh, during the last years of his reign, uh, he, he committed uh, a vast portion of his fortune for the building of the temple. In fact, he went out, out of his way to collect silver and, and gold in abundance. So all Solomon had to do was to find the workmen to build the temple. All the materials David, uh, as well as others, uh, had assembled. Uh, but if David was zealous for the house of God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, far more so. Uh, and uh, we won't turn to John 2, but uh, I've included some of the verses at the bottom of the second column. It was the first Passover of our Lord's public ministry. You find it recorded in John chapter 2. The Lord Jesus goes up at about the age of 30 to Jerusalem uh, to keep the Passover, as was commanded uh, in the law of Moses. Uh, and on that occasion, he cleanses the temple. In fact, he cleansed the temple a second time at the end of his ministry. Uh, on this occasion, in John 2, uh, he says to the rulers of the temple, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Sadly, they didn't heed uh, his claim, his warning, because three years later, when he cleanses the temple, he no longer calls it the house of merchandise. He says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, quoting from Isaiah 56, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And that part is quoted uh, from Jeremiah chapter seven. But coming back to John chapter two, we read in verse 15 that the Lord Jesus made a scourge or a whip of small cords, and he drives those who are trading in animals uh, together with the sheep, the oxen, out of the temple, the money changers who made a vast profit uh, uh, in the, on the house of God, on worship, uh, filthy lucre, turning the grace of God into unholy gain, he expels them from the temple and overthrows the tables. And he commands those who sell doves to take these things from there. And in words I've just referred to, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Uh, it's often occurred to me that if we didn't have any idea of biblic biblical chronology, if we didn't know that there were 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, if you read from Ma Malachi straight through to Matthew, nothing has changed. Malachi is addressed in the priests who pastors reminded us, stole from God. They uh, twisted the law of God and put their own tradition in place. And if we weren't aware that there were four centuries between, you would think that you were talking about the same generation, uh, pre uh, different priests, but the same practices the same ungodly practices were going on in the house of God, and the Lord Jesus cleanses the temple. But notice verse 17. Uh, there must have been uh, a look of authority and a look of righteous anger in our Lord's face, because the disciples uh, are there, at least some of them. Uh, the Lord hadn't necessarily chosen all 12 uh, so early in his ministry, but the disciples, seeing what is happening, recall the scripture. It says, they remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The Lord Jesus went to that temple. It wasn't a holy place as far as the practices that went on, but it was his father's house. And he went, and he went uh, to what should have been a holy place, but was an ungodly place, but he went there with a holy purpose to honor and to worship the Father. 
and very, very early on in his, in his life, the Lord Jesus was conscious of who his father was. Uh, it's not the first Passover that the Lord attended. The first Passover that we know the Lord attended is, this is, is described by Luke, when uh, the Lord Jesus, as a boy of 12, went up to the Passover. And of course, we know the story how Mary and Joseph returned with the other pilgrims and Jesus, the boy Jesus, was left in the temple. Mary and Joseph have to backtrack to Jerusalem and they say, Son, why hast thou dealt thus with us? Thy father and I, thy father and I, have sought thee sorrowing. But the, at the age of 12, the Lord Jesus knew that Joseph wasn't his father. Because what was his reply when Mary said, Thy father and I have sought thee. How is it that he sought me? Wist he not that I must be about my father's business? At the age of 12, he knew he had no human father. He knew that God was his father. And that same zeal increased because verse 17, quotation from verse 9 of Psalm 69, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. But verse 9 of Psalm 69 <coughs> is quoted the second time in Romans. I wish we had more time to spend on this, but you notice in verse, uh, in Romans 15, the Lord G uh, Paul says, We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. Uh, and the context, we won't look at Romans 15. It's going back to Romans 14, where Paul deals with the issue of those uh, Jews who, want, who felt they ought to observe the Sabbath and other holy days, and there were Gentile believers that came from no such background. It also deals, Romans 14, uh, with those uh, who were convinced that it was right only to eat, uh, uh, <coughs> if you like, vegetables and fruit and not meat. There were others who felt they could eat anything, uh, whereas those uh, who were Jews and were now believers in the Lord Jesus, they, uh, they would not touch certain things. And uh, Paul deals with that issue. We're not going to look at it. He says that every man be persuaded in his own mind. He said, food does not commend us to God. If we partake, we are no better spiritually. If we abstain, we are no uh, worse. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Paul deals with the issue and he says, uh, don't do anything that will cause your brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Uh, that's what Paul meant when he said to the Jews, I became a Jew. Uh, when Paul was seeking to win Jews for the Lord Jesus, if he went into the synagogue, he wouldn't touch unclean thing, uh, things that uh, as you regarded unclean. If he was in a Gentile city, uh, he would uh, do what he said to Timothy, whatever is before, uh, set before you, eat, uh, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that's what he means when in Romans uh, 15, he says, we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Uh, and then verse three, for even Christ, Please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Uh, again, uh, quote, quote in from the same verse, verse 9 of Psalm 69. Even Christ pleased not himself. Uh, I know Pastor has often uh, mentioned, uh, people say, why? Why you read the Old Testament? Uh, who was it on Sunday? Uh, I think Alistair said half the uh, uh, old, uh, Bible is the Old Testament. He was very kind to us. You count the number of chapters, it's actually three quarters. Uh, three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament. But if you want a reason why we should read the Old Testament, look at verse 4. The New Testament hadn't been written, uh, it hadn't been completed by the time Paul wrote Romans. Uh, probably not even half of it had been written. Whatsoever things were written aforetime, that's referring to the Old Testament, were written for our learning. 
the old, when God caused the Old Testament to be written, it wasn't simply just for the generation uh, of Jews that was alive uh, when our Lord was uh, on earth exercising his earthly ministry. Paul says, whatsoever things were written were written for our learning. Why? That we, through patience or perseverance and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Interestingly, and I don't want to see you pass this under, you can apply that to the book of Job. Uh, it's part of the Old Testament. Job was written that we might learn from Job that through perseverance and comfort, uh, and it doesn't mean comfortable circumstances, it means being comforted, uh, being cheered, being encouraged uh, <clears throat> by those who have gone through those circumstances, the word comfort really means to strengthen with. That's the root word of it. It doesn't mean to be at ease. It's totally lost its original meaning. In the King James Version, comfort means to strengthen something, somebody with either what you say or do. Uh, you exhort them. And Job and the rest of the Old Testament was written that we, through comfort uh, and patience from the Scriptures, might have hope. It's not comfort uh, to say, cheer up, unless you give a good reason. Every time the Lord Jesus said, be of good cheer, he gave a reason. Uh, or people said, be of good cheer. They said to Bartimaeus, arise, be of good cheer, he calleth thee. Uh, on the sea, when the storm threatened to overwhelm the disciples, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Uh, to the man let down uh, through the roof, son, be of good cheer. There's always a reason. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Uh, and the word of God is written that we, through patience and comfort from the scriptures, might have hope. The logical in inference from that is that if we don't read the scriptures, we can't get the right kind of comfort and the right motivation for persevering is only uh, as we look at the scriptures. And what does the writer of Hebrews say uh, concerning the Lord Jesus? Uh, Consider him. Let us run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before us, endured the cross, despising the shame, yet shame will come, with being identified with the Lord Jesus, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on him. Uh, and the, the servant, the disciple, is no better than the Lord. What did the Lord Jesus say? If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, what will they call those of his household? If we turn to the other side, uh, <coughs> there are other scriptures, uh, and we look at them briefly. Uh, verse 21, we'll leave for another occasion when we look at the cross, but it's an obvious quotation. Psalm 69, verse 21, they gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. If you look at the fourth column on that second side, uh, John 19, verse 28 is a remarkable verse. It says, after this, this is after having suffered uh, upon the cross for six hours, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. I think that's an amazing verse. When you consider how agonizing uh, a death crucifixion was, and the Lord had been on that cross for six hours, yet he had such a clear mind that he knew that he had fulfilled everything that the Old Testament scriptures had said, had written concerning him, except for one thing. He had paid the price for our sins, but it's as if the Lord Jesus, the mind of the Lord Jesus, was going through the Old Testament scriptures. And there was one scripture that had not been fulfilled. And John says in chapter 19, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that, and the Greek word means in order 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. There was one scripture that had not been fulfilled, and that was the scripture in Psalm 69, verse 21. Uh, in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. They given, uh, offered the Lord Jesus vinegar the first time, but it was mixed with gall. Uh, the, the point of that was to stupefy the victim so that the, the agony, the pain, would be in some measure that dull. But the Lord Jesus suffered for our sins. Uh, without the mind, the spirit being unclouded, he felt the full agony physically of crucifixion. And also uh, he suffered spiritually. I can't even begin to enter into the words of Isaiah 53. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. How many sins have I committed? How many sins have you committed? How many millions of people have lived down through the centuries since our Lord's death and for 4,000 years before that? And it almost boggles the mind to think that Scripture says he died not only for our sins, but he died for the sins of the whole world. The hymn writer is right when she says we may not know, we may never know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. Uh, and I think John 19 verse 28, it's amazing that one scripture, you and I might say, well, if the Lord Jesus had paid the price for our sins, because straight after this he cries, it is finished. If he had paid the price for our sins, was it any big deal if he didn't take the vinegar? Uh, that was offered to him at the end, but the word of God mattered so much, God's character is bound up with his word, and the word of God mattered so much, even in the smallest detail to the Son of God, that he saw to it that it was fulfilled. And in the fifth cry, he says in John 19, verse 28, I thirst, and he said it, that the scripture might be fulfilled, and we read in verse 29, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled a sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon his mouth, uh, put it upon his sop, and put it to his mouth. And when that scripture had been fulfilled, because that's the force of verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, then he said, It is finished. He didn't say, What is finished? It simply means accomplished. Personally, I think there was more than one thing accomplished. The price of our redemption certainly was accomplished. But in the context of John 19, I think the word it refers to the scripture as well. He said it, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And when he said, it is finished, he was really repeating what he'd said in John uh, 17. He said, uh, I have finished the work. I have glorified thee on the earth. And in anticipation of Calvary, he said, uh, <coughs> I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. You can't say you've finished the work now if there's another day or two to come because our best plans can go astray. But the Lord Jesus could say that even before he died, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Uh, I had hoped to get on to verse 22, but I think that's going to have to wait uh, for another occasion. Uh, but in closing, there's a, a lovely hymn. I, I don't know whether you've ever sung it in uh, Bethany. Uh, uh, Steve would know it. The chorus goes there's like for a look at the crucified one. And there's a verse of that hymn that says, I think it's by Charles Wesley, that as far as the unbeliever is concerned, then doubt not thy welcome, since God hath declared there remaineth no more to be done, because once in the end of the age he appeared and completed the work he began. He began that work in the Garden of, uh, in the Garden of Eden when he said to the serpent, the woman's seed shall crush your head, you will crush his heel, uh, and that was accomplished 
at Calvary, where the Lord Jesus triumphed over principalities and powers, and he paid the price. That means heaven is open to you and to me, and to everyone that will put their faith in the Saviour. Uh, I'll end there, I'll take more time, and I'm aware that that clock is a few minutes slow. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you, Andrew.